Very good. Uh, thank you, Dr. KK, for the introduction, and uh, I would like to thank your university and Dr. Gauri for inviting me, and I also want to thank Dr. Faisal for his support. Um, so today, the topic I'm going to present is not just about uh, food production. Food, you know, here it is agriculture. Basically, we are going to talk about, but it is not just about food production itself. But uh, there are various things associated with uh, the food production and consumption and uh, the global agricultural status and so on. So I want to give a, an overview of all these topics uh, in the next uh, few minutes. So um, I asked uh, Dr. KK to share this uh, survey link uh, before this talk. Uh, it is important for me to measure your understanding of sustainable agriculture or food production in general uh, before I give this presentation and uh, about 60 people responded. And uh, if you don't mind, you can either, uh, you know, quickly take a survey uh, before I continue. I, I'll briefly wait. You can either use your phone, uh, you know, camera to uh, scan the QR code or uh, type in the URL. It only takes a minute to submit your input. I'll briefly wait. This is for those who haven't had a chance to submit your survey. While you are doing that, I will continue with my presentation. So I just want to, before I go further into it, I just want to tell you what my research focus has been uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, it, it has always been non-chemical pest management and disease management approach using microbial control options or botanical uh, solutions, bio, biological pesticides and so on. And then also for the past several years, uh, I have been doing extensive research with biostimulants and uh, you know, the overall goal is integrated pest management, you know, uh, trying to uh, develop sustainable food production uh, strategies and promote them. So I want to mention this first because it helps you to understand where I am going from here. And the outline of today's uh, presentation is that I want to give uh, some background about crop production in general and then what what kind of uh, different approaches there are in you know producing food or crops and then answers to some commonly ask questions about uh, you know conventional agriculture or organic agriculture gmos and some of those uh, kinds of questions and then finally i would like to ask all of you uh, just one question um, so so food production actually started agriculture started more than 9000 years ago you know when we had hunter gatherer communities and they were basically hunting animals and eating and then you know they started uh, uh, raising crops and they figured out a you know um, growing crops and harvesting uh, grains or fruits or vegetables and so on so that is how agriculture started and it did not look as organized as you see uh, in this uh, painting here uh, it's much rough because you know there are some plants that produce food and there are weeds, there are, uh, you know, pests that are attacking these crops and then there are uh, some beneficial arthropods that are attacking these pests. Then you have beneficial microorganisms and then you also have plant pathogens and so on. So it is a dynamic environment with a good and bad microorganisms in the soil and also in the environment and uh, lots of environmental uh, factors like excessive heat or cold or you know rains everything interacting with each other and the productivity as you can imagine is uh, very low because they're you know doing some basic agriculture there and uh, probably left it to um, you know left the crops to grow on their own and uh, 
harvest whatever they could harvest from uh, when the, from the plants that were able to complete their life cycle. Then we, as as time passed, and then in most most of the agriculture, majority of the agriculture uh, was a subsistence farming. Although there were some large scale agricultural efforts uh, here and there, but most population, most agricultural community was producing just uh, enough food in a small area to support the family and also uh, for some kind of trade, local trade. So that's how it was for um, you know thousands of years. But over the afterwards, it it completely transformed from that kind of subsistence farming to this kind of uh, extensive industrialized agriculture. Here you are seeing a greenhouse uh, for ornamentals, not for food production. Ornamental greenhouse in Guatemala, and then you see this uh, cabbage and cauliflower kind of brassica crops in California. Then this is a, a larger strawberry field again in California, and this is is a, a citrus uh, orchard um, uh, then we we have this uh, vineyard so you can see how agriculture expanded to large scale and commercialized and farming so things had to change it, it is no longer you can just uh, sow uh, a few seeds or plant a few transplants and then uh, get whatever you uh, are you know, um, uh, getting from that at the end of that uh, production cycle. Uh, you, you need to protect the crop, provide um, nutrients that the plant requires and also uh, take care of other issues. If you if there are like the in the previous slides, you, you saw that uh, netting. Uh, this is uh, either to sometimes they provide netting over the uh, trees and or the uh, plants uh, to protect from insects or sometimes to prevent uh, pollination here uh, it is to prevent from pollination um, because the, if you want to pr produce something seedless so depending on the consumer needs and crop needs uh, agriculture changed into open open field production or greenhouse uh, production and so on so Considering all these changes, we, we need to also look at how pest management or, or crop production practices changed. So agriculture now is no longer it is subsistence farming and it is it is a complex uh, art and science and a global uh, enterprise. Um, you know, uh, uh, growing crops is not an easy thing. They, it is, like I mentioned, it is a very dynamic environment because you have all those uh, microbes in the soil, organic matter, worms, and uh, other microscopic worms that damage the crops and sometimes they uh, also protect the crops. So some of them protect the crops from other ones. So we have these uh, bad and good microbes, insects or worms or other organisms um, interacting with crop production and uh, then now we we have to protect them and maintain the productivity uh, to maintain that uh, food uh, supply um, so when we had the change of agriculture to this extent and especially producing the same crop in large large uh, acres uh, in, in some countries it is small and in developed countries, as you saw here, uh, it is uh, hundreds of uh, acres that, with the same crop. Uh, whether we have a diverse farming like several crops in a small area or a monoculture uh, like uh, I showed in the pictures, uh, agriculture has changed quite a bit and uh, it, it, it has to um, respond to the changing situation with the global trade and travel. We have a lot of new pests and diseases that are spreading throughout the world. Um, the most recent uh, uh, experience of you, especially you had is the um, these uh, migratory locals. Uh, you also how they were uh, crossing the borders from one continent to another continent and uh, can cause that kind of uh, devastation. So and, and the same way when people travel from one country to another country, we might be taking uh, some plant material along with the plant material, potential pests or diseases either intentionally or unintentionally. So all these things are changing. Um, and agriculture requires a lot more attention than it uh, did several years ago, even in the recent past 10, 20 or 50 years ago. And 
when it comes to uh, crop protection um, or the solutions that uh, we, we have to provide to maintain the productivity, initially there are natural solutions. Whatever nature did, that's what. Uh, that was 9,000 years ago or a few thousand years ago. Then afterwards, it as agriculture advanced, they were looking for nature-based solutions or you know, using plant extracts and other materials in the environment or then in, in the nature they can find, they use them to protect the crops. And then it gradually changed uh, with the industrialization uh, where we needed to provide synthetic uh, inputs, whether these are fertilizers or pesticides, uh, this commercial agriculture uh, contributed to the expansion of uh, the use for these products. And now that we realize that excessive use of these the synthetic materials is not good for the environment and we have to maintain the balance in the soil and also above, above the ground, then we are again going back towards nature friendly solutions. So it is a positive change, like going towards reducing the negative impact of agriculture on the environment and going for nat nature friendly solutions is a, a positive change. Uh, but what, what is happening now in the world? Uh, you know, previously farmer produced whatever they could produce and the consumer, uh, you know, consumed it. Consumer uh, ate the food that the farmer produced or the whatever was locally available, but it is changing now. We we have global export of food from everywhere to everywhere, and uh, they are also available season long in some places, season long in the sense year long in some places because of the uh, cold storage or processing and other advancements uh, we have, and. Uh, it, it, uh, most importantly, it is no longer producer and consumer driven enterprise. It is mostly uh, retailer driven enterprise in many places, although it is consumer driven uh, in, in some places um, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the developed countries. Um, it is more or less the retailers are deciding what the consumers are buying by strategically placing certain items and uh, you know that it is like uh, uh, the brands and uh, certain um, kinds of uh, visual cues they provide so that you are attracted to those kinds of uh, um, marketing strategies and then buy things more on impulse rather than on your need. Uh, but this is not all kinds of food, but uh, you know um, certain things are consumer like that. So. The, this is uh, briefly what has happened uh, historically um, in, in food production and what we are seeing now. And then the next thing is uh, what kind of food or agricultural system do we want? What is an ideal system? You want it to be safe, you want it to be sustainable, and you want it to be secure. So for the safety, we do not want any harmful chemical residues or contaminants or biological like microorganisms or uh, some other disease causing uh, contaminants. We do not want them. And then the, when it comes to the sustainability, we want it to be socially acceptable. Everybody should accept the way the food is produced because uh, there are different ways of producing food and some are objectionable to others. So we want something that is acceptable to everybody and they, it should not create uh, classes, social classes based on the kind of food we consume or the kind of food we can afford. And then we want it to be economically viable. Someone asked the question, what is sustainability means in the chat window? And this is kind of the answer for them. So the viability is not, a, not always uh, for one person or one entity. Here we are, we have three entities here, retailer, producer, which is the farmer, and then the consumer. Those consumer have to be, uh, you know, the f first of all, the farmer has to be able to uh, make profits from the crop production, and then the retailer, because they're selling, and they have to make some profit and sell, and consumer, we should be able to afford them. So we want economic viability everywhere. The first of all, the farmer should be able to make money because they are the ones producing food. And then we want uh, the food production system to be environmentally safe because you have seen what happened if we indiscriminately use any kind of agricultural input. It, it doesn't have to be 
a synthetic one or some organic ones also can cause serious damage in the environment to the environment and I will give some examples later on, but we want something uh, the food production system to be environmentally safe and then we want the security in terms of uh, enough food security for the local communities. Uh, you, you are aware that there is uh, not everybody can afford food and not everybody has access to food even in developed countries. They call urban food deserts in, in the US like you know that you, you are in the middle of a city but uh, there is no affordable food for some families uh, because the poverty or low income poverty is everywhere. Uh, so we want enough food for the local communities and we also want enough food for the uh, growing global uh, population. Um, it is continuously growing and we want to make sure that everybody has uh, um, enough food to eat and we obviously want that to be affordable to everybody. So this is an ideal system. It has to be safe, sustainable and secure. You have to look at all these aspects when you are looking at whether conventional, organic or any kind of uh, uh, zero budget and there are various kinds of uh, food production systems. You have to look at all these, not just uh, environmental safety or just uh, you know being it clean or nutritious or some of those. You want to make sure that uh, there are that that production system addresses all of them. And briefly about the population trends and food security and uh, malnutrition and so on. Like you, we all are familiar that the global uh, population is increasing gradually and we are at 7.8 uh, billion people now. And as you can see here, it is actually in the developing countries, the population growth is higher than in the developed countries, which is uh, which has been more or less stable. And then another issue is change in the demographics like of uh, urban and rural populations actually. If you look at this, the urban populations are gradually increasing and rural populations are gradually decreasing in, in here, especially here. Uh, you know, it, it is a, a, a scary thing, which means there are fewer people in the villages or in the rural communities to produce crops. We did not have and, and many of you uh, associated with uh, farming yeah, are aware of a uh, labor shortage because people are moving towards urban areas for work and uh, you know there are a lot of issues with farming and we don't have enough people and th that is not good for any country. This is as you see it is not just in one country but it is a global trend we are seeing. That means if we have fewer people and maybe uh, less of a land for agriculture food production. We need to increase the efficiency both of the people with the, you know we have to mechanize farming or we have to find out ways to increase the productivity. So this is something I just had today uh, uh, when I was looking for some information that uh, it, uh, apparently there are 1.9 billion obese people, overweight people in this world that is also related to malnutrition. You know, malnutrition is not always about uh, not having enough food. Uh, it is also not eating a balanced diet and having um, health issues related to imbalanced diet. So we have 1.9 obese people and then 462 million undernourished uh, people in this world. That is uh, nearly a, a one third of the population. And imagine what kind of impact uh, bad dietary habits or health um, food conditions can lead to for someone's health and uh, you can imagine uh, the billions of dollars it would cost uh, to maintain their health or you know even if they don't get sick when they're young maybe their productivity is lost or maybe they are prone to uh, more diseases or other health issues later in their life that can be a huge burden especially everybody is aware of the impact of uh, uh, this covid-19 pandemic and how a disease can uh, change the, uh, the way the world operates. So we need to be aware of the, the impact anything, not just food, anything 
can have a bigger impact because we live in a dynamic and uh, global uh, economy and global um, kind of a family kind of a situation here. It is a global uh, population, no longer isolated to one country or one culture. We are regularly interacting, influencing each other uh, through various ways. So we need to understand what kind of impact food production a, a, a food production system can have on the economy uh, locally and globally. And this is uh, a, a, an unfortunately a scary picture of uh, children and women, uh, the kind of uh, uh, health issues they have from this uh, malnutrition. So if you see uh, there is uh, this, you know, overweight issue here in some countries, Australia and uh, North America, and then uh, in India, it is anemia and stunting. And in other countries, it is, uh, you know, one or two issues, one, two or three issues. So here in several African countries, you have this overweight anemia and stunting. All are related to food and uh, how much someone can afford and uh, whether it is uh, a nutritious uh, uh, diet or not and so on. And uh, another um, unfortunate thing here is that the, the, the stunting, how prevalent and uh, how widespread uh, it is in India. It is anywhere from uh, less than 20% to more than 40%. And, uh, you, you know, in, in some areas like here, uh, probably the, this is these are uh, you know ma major agricultural uh, areas and in other areas you see the, there is quite a bit of uh, stunting and it is not good for any country it is not just about uh, you know the height of uh, uh, a person but it is the collective health of a country and the collective um, um, success of a country through various uh, um, lifestyles. <laughs> And uh, the next one is we we, we are talking until now about uh, um, uh, lack of food or lack of uh, proper nutrition. But now I want to mention something about uh, how much food is wasted around the world. So it is happening simultaneously. In, in on one hand, we are producing a lot. On the other hand, we are not distributing it to everybody or making it affordable to everybody. So here what you see is, uh, you know, how much food is um, wasted. Uh, this, these are, you know, probably meat or food. Uh, I mean, fruits or vegetables or grains. Uh, how much is wasted at the production on the farm or at the retail market? And then this is these uh, 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 maroon colored uh, sections of these bars are uh, wasted at consumer level. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this consumer level wastage is more in developed countries uh, compared to you know Latin American countries, South uh, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, for obvious reasons, we know we want to we, we want to be careful because wherever food is uh, scarce, you you are more careful. Wherever food is expensive, you are more careful. Uh, but this is the average. But in urban areas, in any country, uh, in in middle class uh, or upper middle class families, uh, there, there can be uh, food wastage more or less uniformly in all these countries. So here are some examples of what could happen. And uh, this is uh, a citrus orchard in California. And I don't know what happened here, but you see a lot of fruit is there. You may not see this kind of wastage in all countries, but this could be because of there might be a sudden, um, you know, heavy wind event or maybe there was a, a, some kind of damage to this fruit they had to discard or maybe they didn't have enough people to actually market it. Sometimes it costs more to harvest and uh, send it to uh, the processing place than just, uh, you know, throw it out. It could be multiple reasons, but the, the, you can see there is food wasted here. And then here, uh, here you, you, you see another kind of a problem here in the in the cabbage field. So this cabbage here looks fine, and uh, similarly some of them are, are just fine. And uh, but there are some uh, damaged ones, the diseased ones here. So this field actually has a disease problem, and they left out. But at the same time, you have a lot of uh, normal, healthy cabbage heads, but. It is difficult to just pick and choose some uh, in, in, in especially in a, a big country like uh, America. Uh, 
uh, on a small farm, it is operated by uh, you know a family or a few people. Yes, we can go and harvest whatever is looks good. But when you are harvesting, uh, you you saw how big these fields are. They 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 have a crew going and harvesting things and packing and putting on the uh, in the in the boxes and it they immediately get shipped. Uh, so you you have to look at the logistics issues, and so these could also cause a problem. And sometimes the retailer wants this many thousand uh, tons of a particular item, or or this many thousand boxes of a particular items, uh, fruit or vegetable, and a farmer cannot plan exactly to produce that amount. So they always plant more than that. And then they can't sell, or they don't need uh, a lot, a lot of uh, that overproduced uh, fruit or vegetable. Then they leave them in the field. Uh, there are some efforts to actually get them and to give it to people, but you have to look at the cost of harvesting. And sometimes it can be a safety issue. Sometimes it is a liability. If someone falls in the uh, field, maybe they can be the farmer can be sued. So there could be a lot of issues in different countries. Uh, and even in a country, uh, small country, I, I mean, in a, in a uh, country like India or Southeast uh, Asian country, there could be still issues. So you can't just have people come and harvest. So because of this, food is wasted. And then uh, what can, uh, there, there are other issues that cause damage to the crop. Here you see a soil borne pathogen uh, almost destroying the entire strawberry field. And, uh, you know, sometimes an organic way of controlling pests and diseases may not stop that pest or disease uh, because you know the ways of certain things work and they uh, they just uh, have to forego because for, for example what happened here um, they typically fumigate the field to kill weeds and disease uh, causing organisms in the soil but this person did not fumigate because it is expensive and uh, but you know when there is no disease this is fine but when they had a disease like this you see uh, the devastation in this field so we need to prevent this otherwise this can this can uh, spread to neighboring fields and if it is an insect you are familiar like if we don't control insects they can spread all over the world there are so many uh, global pest problems uh, like a fall army worm and uh, now, now the locusts and so on they can uh, migrate and cause a huge damage, so we need to uh, control them effectively right there. And here is another example. The, these are not commonly a problem, but these are migratory insects. These are chinch bugs. Uh, they come in large numbers, and if you don't treat them, treat the crop immediately, as you can see, is, uh, hundreds of them can feed and damage uh, strawberry or uh, any uh, kind of uh, host they come across. So we need to prevent the damage too. And then there are other issues here. Uh, you know, consumers preferring certain kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables. Everybody wants the fruit to be uh, looking perfectly nice and perfectly shaped. And they sometimes, uh, you know, not necessarily in India, but in, in uh, developed countries, they have to be nicely packaged as if you manufacture that uh, in a factory. You cannot have uniform sized uh, fruits or vegetables um, that easily. So you might have to throw some of them or sometimes here what, uh, you know, you know the, for example, this is strawberry is uh, not marketable in California or in the United States because it has this deformity. It is edible, it is nutritious, it does not have any damage, insect uh, like disease or uh, like uh, any, any damage that could harm us. Uh, but this is not marketable. And the same way, cherries, when they have double cherries like this, or when they have projections like that, they these they cannot sell, and these uh, fetch lower prices. And uh, the same way, when you have uh, outgrowths like this, uh, then they they are not marketable, uh, or they have to sell it to a store which where they have to sell it for a very low cost because consumers don't like it or maybe the retail market does not want to sell anything that does not have perfect shape so who is responsible for this and you know millions of pounds or kilograms of pesticides are used or other agricultural inputs are used to prevent the damage like this or, or uh, you know a lot of edible food is discarded because of deformities like that 
So the consumer preference about food is mainly we want it to be clean. It is fair and we want it to be safe. It is very reasonable because we want our food to be clean and safe for consumption and we want it to be nutritious too. But that nutritious part depends on what we consume. It is not the way they are produced. Unlike many um, of us generally believe that uh, a certain way of producing crops makes them healthier. It is or nutritious. It is not. Uh, it is not true. Uh, and I can explain it later. So we want it clean, safe, nutritious and affordable because it is also very important and then up to those four, four top four points it is fine but when you look at we want it to be perfectly shaped and neatly packed and uh, and we also want it because uh, you know we're buying them in bulk we also want them to uh, last uh, for a while when i was growing up i remember uh, you know vegetables were brought every two days or so or sometimes every day or you know very frequently and they would buy it for a day or two and then you know you cook them eat them and you wouldn't even put them in the refrigerator um, because everything was freshly purchased freshly cooked and consumed and done like there is minimal wastage but it is changing we are trying to buy them in bulk uh, whether it is in cities or uh, small uh, uh, towns uh, you, you know people Life has become uh, very busy with work. You don't have the same time we had uh, 30, 40 years ago to go shopping regularly uh, and we are distracted by a lot more things or have become busy. And in uh, some places in cities, it is even more difficult. You can, you know, the commute and other uh, um, factors that take a major part of your life. So you have to buy them in bulk so that they last for a week or something like that. So you want that to be imagine if you take something directly from the field it won't not everything lasts that long they have to be treated for example if you have an apple it has to be washed and if you leave that uh, uh, moisture on the top then you will see fungal growth uh, whether it is an apple or some other citrus fruits or anything so what you have to do is you have to coat them with edible wax. Uh, this is not plastic, it is edible wax, or you have to treat them with the mild um, disinfectants, and they, they have to be approved by the government at the certain levels. So, you know, you have to do all these things. It is no longer 100% uh, natural. Uh, you are adding other things because of these uh, lifestyle changes. And then a, a big thing is that we want a lot of things available throughout the year. And and uh, you know and and we also want that all over. We want uh, the foods that are available only in southern India will be consumed in North India. And uh, then the same way on the northeast, people in the northeast or people in the west, and each uh, climatic region produces certain kinds of fruits and vegetables. But uh, we want to taste them. There is nothing wrong. Uh, we want to taste all those exotic foods and uh, then you know you have to uh, send them uh, you know that it takes time sometimes you have to refrigerate sometimes you have to do other things to keep the quality so with these kinds of expectations it is not just within any within india or within a country you know you you know that uh, um, a, a lot of uh, nut, nuts like almonds pistachios are exported from uh, the United States from California actually and the same way the mangoes from India are exported to other places and other countries rice is exported so we want things that are available here uh, are like you know the everybody is becoming global in their food culture so everything uh, um, is uh, you know expanding the export is expanding all over the world and that also has its cost and then at the with all these demands like clean safe nutritious affordable and uh, you know has to look good and it has to be from a different country or different place and at the same time we want it to be sustainably produced there is nothing wrong in that but we need to understand what sustainable a produced means and the most common things that you hear are you know um you know uh, pesticides and fertilizers and all those things so residues harm to the environment so on uh, but we need to understand we need to understand the science behind uh, how these are thing uh, how these are used and uh, who is regulating them and who is actually violating these uh, policies 
So if you look at the agriculture and the impact it has, I'm not talking about any particular kind or any, uh, you know, any country all over. In general, food production has an impact on the environment, right? So one is, you know, when we when we use excessive agricultural inputs, whether it is synthetic fertilizers or manure, natural fertilizers or uh, pesticides of organic nature or synthetic uh, nature, anything we use excessively can have an impact. Just because it is a natural product, it doesn't mean it is safe. Uh, you know, you, there, there are a lot of uh, natural materials um, in the, from the plants. We can uh, have garlic, uh, uh, turmeric, and uh, we can have some of those uh, essential, you know, um, um, certain phytochemicals from certain plants. But at the same time, we also have poisonous plants, and we know that some of them we use as pesticides. So. Just because it is natural, it does not mean it is always safe. They have to go through the same kind of regulation like a synthetic uh, agricultural input uh, has to go through. Then, uh, you know, the negative impact that uh, uh, agriculture has is a depleted soil health. Um, when fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers increase the crop productivity, until that point, you know, crop productivity has been, uh, was very low. And then once they realize that, you know, we can spray these chemicals to control pests and diseases, we can add these fertilizers to the soil to increase the yields, then everybody started using them indiscriminately. And you need this soil is a very uh, uh, living organism or dynamic environment because it has lots of organisms there. The microbes are macroorganisms and microorganisms, roots uh, of both crop plants and weeds, and then a lot of organic matter supporting these organisms. So there is a cycle, uh, a, a busy cycle going on, changing one kind of uh, material into another kind and making it available to the plants as nutrition. So when we remove the organic matter and when we uh, do not follow certain agricultural practices of crop rotation or cover cropping and you know adding this organic matter kind of thing, soil health decreases. So if you add organic matter and then use the synthetic uh, fertilizers, uh, crops will do just fine, environment will be just fine but it is uh, the abuse is what causes the problem. And then at the same time, contamination of the groundwater is a big issue. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how big an issue India recognizes this uh, as at this point, but it is a big issue in the United States and in some other places because the same thing. Uh, when you apply excessive fertilizers, again, whether it is synthetic or organic fertilizer, whatever is applied in excess and plant cannot consume, it goes uh, into the, it contaminates the, it because it leaches into the soil or away from the soil. So it can uh, contaminate the groundwater or it contaminate the water bodies and cause uh, causes a lot of uh, problems, health problems or environmental problems. So we want to make sure that we apply what plant can use and then harmful pesticide residues. That is uh, again, whether we use uh, biological or synthetic pesticides, um, we don't want to leave harmful residues. We want to use them only according to the prescription, which is the label guidelines that, uh, you know, um, a, a pesticide company produces or a fertilizer company. Fertilizer company may not have those kinds of guidelines, but uh, pesticide companies have uh, everywhere. They tell you how much to use and when to use. And especially in the uh, in the United States and other places, there are strict guidelines for personal protective equipment and uh, how you, when you can actually enter after you spray a pesticide. You, once you spray it, you can go back until uh, a day or two days or 14 days or however long the pesticide requires you to stay away from the field, you have to stay away. But uh, you know, when we don't take care of these uh, uh, take requirements and don't follow the guidelines, we end up having some problems. So it is not the pesticides that cause the problem. It is improper use of pesticides and the lack of regulation or adulteration of pesticides or you know lack of education uh, to know how to use. All these things actually cause a lot of uh, problems here. And then 
we also have to make sure that there is no negative impact of whatever we do, whether we apply these uh, uh, pesticides or um, the fertilizers or anything else, plant growth regulators or anything we apply, we want minimal negative impact on beneficial or non-target organisms. Uh, these could be natural enemies or these could be pollinators. These could be other other uh, organisms that uh, you know we want to uh, leave them alone. We want to maintain the balance and our objective is to grow crops. With the least disturbance to the uh, environment. So can we do that? You know with with all these things we have seen like all this use of uh, agricultural inputs and all the harm to the environment. Is there an alternative? There is an alternative and uh, you know, but we want to I, I want to show you different kinds of food production approaches here. There are three major ones and you all are familiar with two that uh, uh, conventional agriculture, which is more or less like industrial farming and uh, sometimes even if it is a small scale farming, the heavy emphasis is on you know putting these uh, synthetic materials and uh, uh, the emphasis is to increase the productivity, do whatever it takes and minimize the cost and increase the productivity. Then we have this organic agriculture. Everybody is familiar with this one too. Here it is more like a holistic approach. You want to maintain the balance and uh, you and and uh, try to take advantage of the natural systems and use only natural products. No synthetic uh, agricultural inputs can be used. This is how it originally started. But uh, are we sure that it is uh, done exactly the same way it is intended to be? It is not because a lot of things have changed and uh, you know a lot of chemicals uh, or organic uh, agricultural inputs are equally bad if used excessively or if, if used repeatedly, uh, whether they are again fertilizers or it can be bio pesticides. Uh, so they have their risk too. So we have to be careful there too. So uh, we have these two extremes like a conventional and then organic. Then the third one is IPM based. So this is more like maintaining the balance. You, you want to use whatever is necessary, but in with the focus on this economic viability, social acceptability and environmental safety. So this is uh, the reason I cited myself is like I, I last year I published a new IPM model which has become very popular and that is where I address. I mean IPM has been there for a long time. But the new model has a lot more things than uh, what the traditional model had. Um, and then crop production approach. If you look at this, how you are producing crops in conventional. Here it is both synthetic and natural fertilizers, pesticides and other inputs are, are used actually. The, whether, whether people realize or not, using host plant resistance like hybrid resistant varieties or using uh, certain cultural practices uh, to modify or sometimes uh, you know conserving natural enemies or releasing biological control agents. So conventional agriculture also uses all of them, but it is not always the biological or balance. It is uh, a lot of times at least in the perception of many people. It is like you know environmentally not safe, but it is not like that always. Especially in, in the US, a lot of conventional growers already uh, implement uh, non chemical approaches. Then you have this IPM base. Here you have a serious emphasis on using all these tools. You know, you want to balance everything and use chemicals or synthetic materials only as needed so that you know you are taking advantage of natural solutions and uh, ecological balance. But when you have a serious disease problem or pest problem or nutritional deficiency for a crop and you suddenly need to take a corrective measure, you can use uh, chemical um, inputs. So this is a balanced approach. Then here organic, I say it is a, a skewed sustainability. The reason is you end up using a lot of uh, pesticides in organic agriculture and some of them are very dangerous to the environment, but uh, because you have to do certain things like you have to control a pest, there is nothing else available for chemical or IPM conventional or IPM based agriculture. You have 
a variety of uh, uh, um, agricultural inputs and uh, pesticides that belong to various mode of action groups so that you can use one or the other and rotate them and use in a balanced way. But here you have limited opportunities. So you might end up using the same ones and that could cause some resistance problems. Um, the same thing, it you know, it prohibits the use of synthetic fertilizer, which can be applied in a very precise way to the plant uh, as needed. But here you can do that in organic agriculture. So sometimes you end up adding a lot more, which uh, the plant does not use and can cause contamination to the environment. And then the production cost, typically low for conventional because, you know, um, relatively cheaper inputs and IPM based, it is optimized. The reason is you might you might think or one might think, OK, it is chemically cheaper, but here I'm using a biological product which is a little more expensive. But think about it. If you overuse a chemical and insects become resistant, then you don't have anything. So you have to use those biological ones more and more. But even if the uh, insects or diseases become resistant to that, then you don't have anything. So if you, when it, uh, uh, we are talking about the production cost, it is not just about for a season or two, but it is the long-term benefit we may have from this balanced approach. And uh, when it comes to organic, a production cost is generally higher because you cannot spray herbicides. You have to do uh, a lot of things in a different way. And um, so it can increase the cost, uh, like many of you are aware. And then returns to the farmer. Then here in the short term, the farmer can make a lot of money, but uh, if things they are using don't work anymore, then they can run into big losses. But here IPM based, again, we, we keep using the word balance here because it is balanced. So it is it can continue to be higher, you know, unless you have a serious problem that you cannot control. If you take an average or overall performance of a crop and the productivity, the returns are higher. Whereas for organic, it is usually moderate. In some cases it is higher, but uh, it, it, it not always. It costs a lot more for the growers or the farmers to produce organically. And then uh, look, controlling the endemic and invasive pests, like there are a lot of pests that are coming from other places. And then we also have endemic pests. And it, for some of them, it is very important to have uh, these uh, chemical control options uh, available. And again, IPM, uh, for IPM to control them, we need uh, again all kinds of uh, host plant resistant or uh, modifying the cultural practices or using traps or using pheromones, using uh, some kind of baits or using microbial botanical pesticides and chemical pesticides. When we use all of them as needed, then uh, you, you are able to take control of uh, those um, pests. Then organic, managing some pests is very difficult. An uh, un unmanaged pests can become an area-wide problem. Uh, again, I want to bring you, uh, your attention to that locust issue. Uh, you know, it, 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 when you have a big problem like that, we want that issue to be taken care of immediately. Yes, there are some biological options to control locusts, but when the pest population is overwhelming, we have to take drastic measures. And uh, that is why this IPM allows you to do that. When you have completely organic, you, you can do that. You Even if you lose your life or your farm, you still have to do that. And it, it can lead to problems sometimes. And a lot of organic farms I visited in different countries, you know, um, in, in uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, and other places, they have a lot of, or even here, they, they have a lot of weed problems, especially the small ones. Weed control is not easy and uh, you might think you're producing uh, very well, but the weeds are actually taking up all the nutrition and they're reducing the uh, um, productivity and they can also harbor pests and diseases that damage uh, the crop plants. Then pest control efficiency, uh, uh, you know, it is generally higher unless we have a resistance issue from overuse of uh, pesticides and in IPM based system, it is higher. And because we are using multiple approaches, we have minimal uh, problem of uh, resistance issue um, and yields uh, are also higher here. And then in organic, 
it is low to high depending on the extent uh, of the problem you have on what kind of options you are using. And, uh, you know, I frequently, uh, you know, uh, get asked by some organic farmers like we are having this problem. What do we do? You know, they have tried all they have already tried everything they could, but still uh, they're not able to control. So this is where we need to be sure because why they are not able to control. Like I mentioned earlier, they have limited pesticide options. And if any of you thought that organic is pesticide free, it, it is not true. Organic is uh, uh, agriculture actually uses more number of pesticides, higher amounts of pesticides than conventional because they have to control the pests. Pests are common everywhere. They, they attack equally all these uh, systems. But here you have limited options, so the, so you have to keep spraying the same pesticide more times, and that causes resistance problems. Um, several organic pesticides uh, have resistance issues, and that's a bigger challenge. That is one main challenge in organic food production. Then the resistance, like just I already mentioned that uh, here we have a higher risk uh, from repeated use, and here it is lower risk because it is uh, taking advantage of multiple approaches and uh, trying to minimize the use of any particular uh, option that can uh, cause uh, resistance problem. And then here it is more or less same as this one. You know, repeated use uh, can lead to pesticide problems, and that is very common here uh, in organic agriculture. Then natural enemies. Uh, here we can quickly go over some of these like, you know, natural enemies are these beneficial uh, arthropods. It can have a negative impact if not, if, if the grower is not careful. Here it is minimum to moderate and organic too, it is minimum to moderate because some organic pesticides are, you know, safer to these natural enemies, but some are not. And then environmental impact. So here, you know, if you do things right, conventional agriculture, can be safe, but it is only when uh, you know you are not using that non-chemical alternatives and heavily uh, depending on synthetic materials and uh, you know to reduce the cost and not keeping the environmental or human health issues in mind, then it can lead to a problem. But here, IPM-based environmentally safe and organic can be environmentally safe unless they again same thing if they don't keep using certain things then it can cause problems too then human health you know human health again in the us or some developed countries there are strict regulations and this is very important uh, you know, especially in india you it, the, the reason many people are afraid of conventional foods or pesticides in india or, or in several countries is lack of strict enforcement of these uh, pesticide use uh, guidelines. So here it is, they, they're strictly enforced and then that is why, uh, you know, in most, I mean, there can be abuse everywhere. There, there, there is no doubt about that. But because of that, it is generally safe. And then IPM based, it is certainly safe because, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, carefully used. And again, organic too, it is safe because it goes through um, all those restrictions for using pesticides and other inputs. Then food security and affordability and conventional. It ensures food security and it is affordable because it is cheap and the productivity is higher generally. And here, as I mentioned, in the long run or short run, it also maintains food security because it maintains that yields. And then affordability is also uh, an important point here that, you know, when everybody is following this process, then it becomes affordable to everybody. It might look like slightly higher price initially because you are using biological and chemical and everything, but it evens out afterwards. So organic, it is food security is very difficult. Uh, you know, you, you, if you, if you are watching this, I'm sure that uh, you know you you have access to um, certain uh, lifestyle and uh, electronic uh, media and Wi-Fi and some of these things. Like generally, uh, that 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 means you these facilities put you at certain level of social status. Uh, and uh, um, because of that, or regardless of that, you know, organic food seems to be affordable for several people, but not everybody. 
I don't buy organic food, regardless of affordability. I don't buy organic food because I see a lot of uh, negative impact of organic food production on the environment. A lot of scientists in the US, they don't believe in uh, organic food production because they understand the science behind it. So food security and affordability, imagine if you are producing organically with the lower yields and potential disease and pest problems, uh, then you cannot uh, support the, the global uh, population. It seems reasonable, like there can be several examples when people are producing uh, more crops, but you have to think it is not because they are producing organically. They have been uh, provided with the good information to grow crops uh, in a better way. Like it is not just about using organic inputs, but they are taught about crop rotation and protecting the crops or adding organic matter. And then they have the support system which ensures the quality of the agricultural inputs, whether they are seeds or transplants or fertilizers and pesticides. Those educational efforts are actually uh, making them su successful. And if you use that everywhere, everybody can produce crops safely and successfully. And then sustainability, you know, it, it is economically viable, the conventional production system, but it is socially not acceptable because of this uh, neg uh, the stigma it has, but it can provide uh, secure food supply. And, uh, it, you know, if, if, if and uh, it can be safe, if uh, inputs are used safely, but here it is economically viable, socially acceptable, but it is you know not determined yet because it has not become a mainstream way of producing uh, crops, but it ensures the food safety and security. Here it is expensive, both for producers because they have to do certain things to maintain that productivity and consumers pay higher price. And it looks good because everybody, you know, has that uh, positive feeling about organic food, uh, but food security is not possible. This is why I showed those global uh, malnutrition, global population, urbanization, malnutrition issues, and how the global uh, trade of agriculture is working uh, and influencing, uh, you know, various other things. So you have to think globally, maybe my community here, my city or my town or my village is able to produce, but what about the rest of the world? We are a global community, we have to think globally. So now I am towards the last part and I'm going to uh, mention a few things like uh, some commonly asked questions uh, about, uh, um, you know, th this is, uh, sustainability and so on. Um, so the first of all, GMO crops. There is a lot of antagonism in the United States and in other, other places too. In India, uh, BT eggplant or BT brinjal um, faced a lot of resistance and it is not there yet uh, as far as I, 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 I know. So first of all, I want to tell you why GMO crops like uh, the BT crops, BT corn or BT soybean or BT cotton, are produced. If you look at these uh, Lepidopteran pests, they cause a significant damage to the crop, whether it is uh, uh, cotton here or, or the corn here or maize, they cause a significant damage and it is not the damage of that uh, worm, but it, they also promote disease and that e even if you remove this part, the fungal spores might be there in the other areas and uh, they could cause serious health issues. So what they did was they use this, you know, Bacillus thuringiensis is a soil bacterium. It coexists with plants in the soil uh, and this is a bacterial uh, cell. OK, so this is the spore and this is a toxic crystalline protein inside that uh, bacterial cell. So when you. When insects feed on this uh, bacterial spore, uh, you know, it, it is poisonous. What happens is uh, imagine this is the insect uh, body and this is the insect gut, the in inside one. So when insect eats these bacterial uh, cells, uh, you know, it is activated by the alkaline pH of the insect gut. Our pH is acidic, 
and uh, you know insect gut th is alkaline so it is dissolved self dissolves and it uh, releases these spores and the protein here the uh, diamond shaped one and it is uh, activated and uh, it, it is uh, actually this is the structure of the protein there are several toxic proteins within that uh, that crystalline um, 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 crystalline shaped object you are seeing there so what it does is it binds to certain cells receptor cells in the gut and makes holes as a result it becomes porous and the contents this is the uh, this is the gut contents leak into the hemocell, which is the bloodstream, and then the blood gets into the insect gut. So, you know, insect dies from septicemia. So that is what it is doing. It is not a microorganism growing and causing infection. OK, you, you, you know, like when uh, insect is infected with the fungus, it is a different uh, way of uh, mode of action. It, uh, you know, invades the tissues and it gradually dies because uh, the tissues are infected and uh, you know insect is dead but here it is the toxin and the toxin to protein is a chemical molecule it is a biological mo molecule but uh, this is what happens here and then it is the toxin that is killing the insect so what scientists did were uh, was that they uh, took the gene responsible for producing this uh, toxin and they inserted that into these uh, plants, whether it is a maize or cotton or soybean and uh, you know other crops, eggplant, they inserted it there, and as a result, uh, it produces the toxin. It does not have any spores or anything, but you know as the plant grows, it produces the toxin. So when the insects feed, they die because they ate the toxin. Because of these Bt crops, they are called Bt. That is a B stands for bacillus and the T stands for thuringians. It's the Bt crops saved millions of tons or billions of kilograms of a pesticide that could have been used to control these uh, devastating uh, pests. And they are used, um, the, these Bt crops are uh, used in many countries, but at the same time, there is a strategy for using them. You just uh, don't, 100% uh, of your field cannot be a Bt crop. You have to use a susceptible regular crops so that insects don't develop resistance easily. But here too, when farmers don't follow those guidelines, that leads to resistance problem. So you, you might think, the GMO crop like that is, uh, you know, bad because we took uh, uh, the gene from a, a pathogen and put it in there. But it is the same thing, uh, you know, that we use growers, farmers use it to spray to control uh, certain pests. The only thing we did is insert there. But before that, I want to mention that, uh, you know, we we are all kind of genetically evolved organisms. Right, you know, we share certain organisms, uh, certain genes with other other species. The same way, certain plants have same uh, genes, and uh, certain fungi and mites share same genes. So we are all connected, and we evolved through this kind of uh, modification from time to time. But it nature, it happened naturally. Like we did not take and put the gene from here to there for eth ethical reasons. It is not allowed now. Uh, everybody understands, but uh, you have to realize that it is that the modification that uh, led to what we are today. And the wheat that we consume now is formed over, you know, thousands or millions of years uh, through uh, genetic aberrations or mutations that change the structure from one species to another species to another species, and ultimately we have what we have. The same way various organisms uh, are also um, have also evolved like that, and we are familiar with the breeding crops for disease resistance or higher yields or some special characters and also. Different kind of organism. But uh, you know when it is a GMO, like a Bt toxic gene placed in a plant, people have an issue. 
but people don't have a problem when the same BT is sprayed to control pests. It, it is a very popular pesticide in organic agriculture. And uh, we have no problem to consume a fruit or vegetable sprayed with this uh, a BT. Uh, we, we, we may have a residue, but when we remove all the unnecessary things and put only the toxin in the plant, then that becomes GMO. But you know, companies have tested extensively to make sure that it is uh, safe. You know, uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the US and other regulatory agencies do take care. I am not saying that everything works perfectly, but uh, you know, consuming BT crops is no more dangerous than a lot of things that we consume. And uh, it, it has proven, it has been proven to be safe to numerous studies. And because of BT crops, environment is actually saved by uh, avoiding several million uh, kilograms of pesticides. Then uh, the, another example is this golden rice. You know, they took this uh, uh, a, a gene that produces uh, beta carotene uh, from other plants and put that in the rice. But the uh, same thing, it is also genetically engineered, but not necessarily genetically modified the way we look at the other one. But this is all, always there. And then these are uh, done to improve the agricultural productivity, protect the environment and uh, maintain food security. So we need to understand the science and the reason behind that before we uh, quickly dismiss uh, any anything. Then synthetic versus natural or organic materials. I want to give a few examples here. Yeah. Here, uh, you know, avermectins, this and then spinosad. Both of them come from different uh, um, bacteria, and they slightly changed the molecular structure and made them into these synthetic materials because sometimes these natural materials are difficult to pro difficult to produce and they are not necessarily stable enough or sometimes they may even have some negative impact, not, not in the case of these, these ones, but sometimes they can have. So what they do is they identify what is the chemical structure of the toxin that comes from a, a microorganism or something like this, pyrethrins or nicotine that come from a plant. They look at those, understand, okay, then, uh, you know, by slightly modifying the structure, it increases the stability and they can industrially uh, produce at a larger scale and make it affordable compared to you know you extracting from an organism or extracting from a plant. So these are more or less the same. And then uh, another example is is uh, strob strobilurin, which is produced from a mushroom, and they developed several uh, strobilurin um, uh, fungicides for controlling diseases. And then uh, sulfur. Uh, the industrial kind of sulfur, which is a, a which is produced from petroleum industry as a byproduct, or you know, as a result of that industry, you have uh, this sulfur, which is not acceptable in organic culture, but uh, agriculture. But mined sulfur, the natural sulfur, is approved. But you know, a lot of times the active ingredient at the chemical level is the same. It is uh, just the in inert ingredient change. So in, in the case of some food, uh, uh, pesticides, it is the same natural molecule, whether it is a fungus or a bacterium or a botanical extract, but the inert ingredients you add make the difference. So several organically approved biopesticides have the same active ingredient as those uh, are used in uh, conven um, conventional agriculture. So, you know, if you we, we need to understand at a molecular level, we are all chemical uh, factories like we, we are like, you know, everything our, our the physiological system and then our digestion and the way nerve impulses are passed through the body and then uh, how we digest food. Everything is a chemical reaction in our body and in the plants and uh, the communication and so on. So chemical is a chemical. We only have to focus on using them carefully, like whether it is natural, it, just because it is natural, it doesn't have to be safe and it is not safe in a lot of cases. So then another thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of people say that uh, organic foods are tastier and more nutritious and so many studies prove that wrong. It taste depends on when you purchase, when you actually harvest. It depends on the variety and the environment it is grown. 
and also when it you know whether you harvested after full maturity a lot of times these days because of this uh, market uh, the transportation of for these fruits and vegetables especially fruits you may not be able to wait until it is uh, nicely ripe and you can harvest because it is too late the shelf life is very low so you have to harvest before it is uh, um, ripe so you you need to understand the taste has absolutely uh, no, no uh, relation to the way it is produced. It is a lot of times it is just the perception. As soon as we think about organic, we think it is uh, tastier, but it depends on the ripeness and other characters. And another thing is that when plants go through stress, just like you know when we have a stress or when we have a rough life, we, we are stronger. The same way when plants don't get enough nutrition, which used to happen in organic agriculture or when they have other uh, stress factors like pests and diseases that uh, we are not able to fully control. The plants produce these defensive chemical chemicals and that actually does increase the nutritional quality to very, very, very uh, minute level because of these, uh, uh, you know, antioxidants and uh, phenolic compounds uh, that uh, in can increase the nutritional value. But you would have to consume large quantities like, you know, 20 bananas or 10 uh, or, you know, uh, 10 kilos of apples uh, to actually benefit from that um, increased nutritional quality. But uh, um, that that is why it is not significant the way we, you know if we are eating a fruit or a vegetable it is it it makes absolutely no difference on the nutritional value that uh, you know based on the way it is produced and then pesticide residues you know it is i want to emphasize that it is the regulations that limit how the pesticide should be used and how much should be used. And in the US, we have this uh, county, which is like a district, state and uh, uh, national or central level agencies that monitor and make sure that things are done correctly. So wherever you have this uh, strict enforcement, food is uh, fairly safe and, uh, you know, they inspect and they look at all these uh, pesticide residues uh, on lots of fruits and vegetables, and especially those produced in the US or in California are always they, they have safe limits. They, they're below the allowed limits. And then another point not directly related to this. If any of you are vegetarians or vegans and uh, you know want to consume organic foods, you might want to know that uh, you know organic crops uh, uh, you know receive animal based fertilizers. It could be blood meal uh, from the meat industry or feathers from the poultry industry or bone meal again from the meat industry or fish meal and so on. So uh, so they, sometimes if these are not processed well, then they could cause other problems. So we need to make sure, but whereas you know the synthetic uh, fertilizers, as long as you don't abuse and use as needed and also add organic material that is uh, cleaner and better. And then again, we, we have all these uh, manure, different kinds of manures. Uh, but here, you know, any, any material is material. You know, whether the protein f comes from plant or animal at the molecular level, they are all the same. But how we produce and uh, how it is cycled in the environment um, could vary or could be similar. Then the environmental impact, okay. This is indiscriminate use has a negative impact in any system. I want to reiterate whether it is organic or conventional, anything that is not used correctly can have an impact. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, organic systems require several pesticide applications. Every organic uh, farmer I come across, they, they, you know, they confirm many times and that, that's my whole profession here working with farmers. So uh, they, they have to use uh, more than usual. And then when we are talking about the environmental cost or the carbon footprint, organic agriculture can be much higher. It is not always less than a conventional agriculture. Like I explained, you know, sometimes you if, if you let us say you apply one kilogram of fertilizer, whereas, you know, a few tons of organic material, where do you get that organic material? It has to come from an animal. 
then animal has its environmental cost and then you have to haul this uh, large quantity to the field and apply and there are associated costs and then again the leaching and there's certain things you are not able to control and then they get they could spill into uh, spill out into other fields and become bigger problems and so we 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 uh, suddenly a lot of times we have bigger carbon footprint from organic agriculture if it is not done correctly and then as i mentioned you know when we don't uh, control certain things and it, it becomes too big a problem and you have to take drastic measures but uh, you know that, that's why we have to make sure that uh, everything is done in a balanced way now the impact of uh, social media or the impact of uh, alternative uh, news items or pseudoscience that is there. You know, if you Google organic or GMOs or pesticides, this is what you see. It is, these are some of the top ones. Like you have this image that organic is for, you know, is good. It is good when you have a balanced system. There is nothing wrong that, you know, about, about that as long as it is done correctly. Then here, see, it is completely misleading. Pesticides don't know when to stop killing, go organic. So this is suggesting that organic agriculture does not use pesticides, which is not true. And pesticides don't know when to stop killing, which is also not true. If, if they can kill, then there is no need to apply all these pesticides and uh, uh, you know have these uh, pesticide uh, pest problems. Why uh, was everybody running around when we had these locals? Government could have told us that, you know, you all stay home and we will spray pesticide, uh, you know, all over the country and then the problem is solved. But it doesn't happen like that because pesticides don't always uh, kill because they have their own limitations. And then here, this is, uh, you know, when I Google for GMO foods, this is what uh, came like, you know, non GMO proje uh, project, just like organically certified, we want to have non GMO. Again, you know, non-GMO is not, not necessarily good for the environment because it might contribute to using a lot of pesticides and unnecessarily causing a lot of damage to the crops and leading to other uh, costs. And here, you know, you see GMO means as if you are in injecting a poison. It is not, it is not like that. And uh, the same way, these are GMO foods as, uh, as if they are monsters. They are not, but this is all fear mongering like chemophobia, uh, you know, having a fear of chemicals and then uh, fear of these uh, scientific advan advancements and putting them in the bad light so that you are afraid of everything. And this helps certain people to sell organic for a higher price because we are all afraid of conventional produce. And then who is making money? I am not making money because I have to spend higher um, amounts to buy those things. And if they are better, then that is one thing, but they are not necessarily better than conventional, especially in the US, they are not better. So then why organic agriculture is popular? You probably have figured out by now. So we see all these things in the social media, you know, all the internet resources, everybody's uh, attached to um, these external uh, sources of information these days with our smartphone. So you go to the market, then it is, you know, it says organic and everywhere this, uh, these uh, incorrect information is floating around saying that these pesticides are bad. All organically produced fruits and vegetables are healthy and tasty, which is not correct. And organic is pesticide free. That's the most common thing people say. Uh, those, so you, you know, you, you are in agriculture, you are uh, studying and you are uh, several of you are faculty. So you, you understand these things. But if you go to the general public and ask, what do you understand about organic? They say it is safe, it is pesticide free, but it is not. And uh, then as a result, you're buying that and it gives you the false sense of security. We might be doing a lot of things. We have no discipline to exercise. We have no discipline to control what we watch on, on the internet or on our phones, like a limit, uh, you know, social interaction, social media interactions or engagements. We don't have uh, a discipline to eat healthy and a, a lead a, a very disciplined good life but it is very easy to buy organic 
because it gives you, okay, I'm doing something good. I mean, it is probably a little more expensive, but uh, I am able to buy this and I'm doing something good for my family or good for myself or good for the environment. That is the false sense of security we have. As a result, we keep buying and the retail market continues to make money and they keep putting out this information and that is how it is continuing. And then growers are producing more organic uh, because especially in the US, uh, a lot of these uh, retailers, they don't buy conventionally produced food items unless that the grower also promises they supply a certain amount of organic uh, produce. Because of that, they have to uh, produce, which costs them more and they, they get less money, but here the market retailers make a lot of money. So they keep uh, strategically putting this organic, healthy, organic and all these colorful uh, misleading information. So that is how organic uh, food is becoming popular. But at the same time, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, in places like India, people are concerned because chemicals are abused there. So if chemicals are abused, what would you do if some, if, if there are some, you know, bad people in a society, you don't all convert them into saints. The entire society doesn't become saints. They, you, you discipline them, you make sure that they behave well so that everybody li lives the normal lives. The same way if pesticide use is uh, not um, you know, done according to the guidelines, according to the required law, local laws or what uh, what is safe for the environment. We have to emphasize on education and implementation, not, not just change and run away from the problem and become organic, but what about uh, millions of people who cannot uh, uh, afford organic food? Aren't we supposed to take care of everybody or do we want to be just selfish because we can afford organic food? Then uh, safety of conventionally produced foods. This is similar to the point I mentioned earlier. This is from US, not, not from India, obviously, because you know, pesticide residues are higher, uh, chemical pesticide residues are higher in Indian, uh, in Indian uh, fruits and vegetables, um, as far as I understand. So here, uh, the question is, is conventionally produced food safe? So this is what, this is from USDA. And they say like you would have to consume 529 uh, servings of apples or this many potatoes, this many strawberries or this many carrots or this many cherries to actually have harmful residues. This is not going to happen, right? We, we are going to eat just a, some, a lot of us don't even eat all these fruits and vegetables. So we are very safe in the US and several countries where this uh, pesticide use is enforced carefully. And then growth and health, you know, here I want to, the, the, we are towards the end, I want to finish by bringing your attention to this comparison. When we are talking about humans and plants, we have a lot of similarities, you know, our heritage determines our genetic makeup, like, you know, whether we have predisposed uh, health issues or do we have good health. The same way, you know, breeding or selecting these good varieties or developing these good varieties gives these uh, plants to produce higher yields and resist uh, these uh, stress factors. Then the environment, just like our, you know, family environment or socioeconomic conditions govern our, uh, you know, education and advancement and our, our nature, the plants also respond to the, you know, the weather conditions, the, the biotic like pests and diseases are beneficial in that environment. And then uh, the, the health of the soil and the cropping system and the socioeconomic factors, which means uh, you know, whether people can afford this kind of food or the people have that education to grow things safely or not, all those influence the farming. And then nutrition, just like uh, uh, we need a balance in nutrition and uh, we take supplements as needed, plants do need the same thing. Plants have to have NPK and uh, uh, several micronutrients, so, you know, silicon, calcium, uh, and and then you know several minerals. They need all those for good health. And uh, you, we may not get all of them from uh, organic materials. Uh, just like we don't get everything from one fruit or one vegetable, we need a variety. The same way, plant, and we also take uh, certain vitamin supplements as needed. And coming to healthcare, you know, we again we need you know physical activity. 
eating yogurt or you know um, in India we have a lot of fermented uh, products and uh, several countries actually have it and in the US too in the past several years the probiotics have become popular after knowing the health benefits then we have to make sure that we regularly get our health checks and then even in medical treatment there are biologicals and uh, then again we we have these mosquito uh, zappers and then uh, mosquito nets and similarly you know and, and the same way we, we do a lot of these things uh, for healthcare lots of issues and then there are several approaches the same way plants also have more or less the same like the biostimulants are like probiotics they, they are like a vaccination and then uh, you know monitoring is like a regular health checkup and then the biological control, similar to the biological medical uh, uh, treatments that we have, and then uh, mechanical, physical, behavioral, which is like mating disruption and pheromones and baits and so on. And then we use the synthetic uh, uh, materials, which are medicines. Everybody uses medicines when we get, uh, you know, when we need it. A lot of us uh, need that. Uh, very, very few people in India actually resist uh, um, these uh, like uh, I mean me medical treatment uh, but but uh, you know depending on their choice people have different uh, kinds of uh, options but even when you are talking about herbal medicine they also have phytochemicals what you get from a herbal medicine like I showed with certain pesticides sometimes not always sometimes it is the same material you have in a synthetic med uh, medicine too so the same way if you look at the health care of humans and the health care of uh, plants, we have a lot of similarity there. So here, you know, when we have an IPM based uh, approach, it is a comprehensive crop care system, just like we do, uh, we do uh, use for our health, then crops can be grown, um, you know, in a, in a better way. So if we have a system not like organic label or anything like if we have a label that uses uh, or a system that uses all these available tools uses synthetic materials when needed judiciously and uh, you know very carefully but with an emphasis on natural solutions you use them just like we use medicines when we need them we want to do follow the same approach for the plants too then we have a balanced way higher productivity and affordability and uh, you know I, I wrote an article about this new IPM model you know you can either google my name Dara IPM paradigm or you know or take a uh, scan this QR code or visit this uh, URL uh, you have a complete uh, detailed article and then I actually published just today I published this uh, video version of that like explaining it is a one hour video explaining this IPM um, system and with this I conclude my talk and I want you to take again one minute to provide your input now that uh, you have listened to my presentation and uh, understand uh, the various food systems I want you to take this uh, survey this is much shorter than the earlier survey 